Look, I really get kicks out of educating people about the stock market. There's just so much misinformation out there. Yeah. And I believe that stockbrokers and financial advisors, they try to make the stock market sound difficult and complicated on purpose, right? To try and confuse people so that you'll use money. them to yeah. pay them money, right? But there's nothing complicated about stocks. It is so easy. And if I can do it, anybody can do yeah. it. In 1837, Horace Mann created the education system, a system at the time designed to pump out factory workers and professors. The same system that is still being used today in the 21st century. Now, Mann's system is backfiring. We are being molded by the same industrial system that has existed for close to 200 years. That system delivers us into a digital economy that has no need of our outdated skills. This isn't our teacher's fault. This isn't the government's fault. This is due to a rapidly changing world full of technology and unforeseen circumstances. And us Gen Zs are caught in the middle. Welcome to the Driven Young Podcast, the podcast for stressed, overwhelmed young Australians, teaching you practical life skills you can implement now to set yourself up in life. And now your host, Byron Dempsey. Welcome back to the Driven Young Podcast, and man, do we have an awesome episode today. As you would have seen by the title of this episode, we are talking stocks and how to get started in the stock market. This conversation is so important and we literally learn nothing about this in high school and I have no idea why because almost everybody should be getting in the stock market at some point in their life. And today we're covering everything you need to know to get started. We're covering it in the simplest way that I possibly can. We're not getting too complicated, we're keeping it very surface level. So hopefully you'll get an overall understanding of how all of these concepts work. Uh, so today I'm joined by Mitchell Stone. He's an experienced broker and has been in the industry for over 15 years. Now the founder and CEO of Initial Capital, Mitchell is passionate about providing education about the stock market to those who are looking to get started. He knows how confusing most brokers make investing seem when in reality it is very, very simple. Now, it's worth noting Mitchell and I have spent many hours putting together a gift for you. We have basically summarized this entire episode into a short PDF document that teaches you everything you need to know about getting started in the stock market. And that will be available for you for free. Just click the link in the podcast description and I will also put it in my Instagram bio. So please, 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 everyone go download that now. It's free and it's a very, very easy way to understand how to get started in the stock market. So in this episode and the PDF, we talk about what are stocks? Why does anyone buy stocks? What are and how big are dividends? What securities are there? What are stocks worth? Why do stock prices change? What are bear and bull markets? When should you buy and sell stocks? What is the stock exchange? Who may buy stocks and bonds? And how do you get started? Plus, we talk about Tesla. What? Plus, we talk about Tesla, the Wolf of Wall Street, and how he did what he did illegally. Crypto, why we can't just print money, inflation, the economy, and we break down everything you need to know to get started. So, by the end of this episode, there is no excuse. You can start dipping your toes into the market, even if you have zero dollars in your bank account, and we will teach you how. I provide a lot of information on this show, but what is important for you as a listener is to implement and do what myself and the guests of the show teach. So right now, go download the PDF we have created for you. It's completely free, and take action action for what we teach in this episode. As per usual, please DM me on Instagram if you enjoy this episode. Make sure to leave a rating on or review on Apple Podcasts. And if you get any value out of the show and want to help support me, I've set up a buy me a coffee link where you can buy me a coffee to help me out as I don't make any money from this show right now. The link is at the bottom in the description or also on my Instagram bio. Now, over to Mitchell. Mitchell, welcome so much to the podcast. Byron, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited about this episode because we've got such a specific topic we're going into and it's a topic that every young person wants to know about, especially lately. I feel like stocks has become really sexy lately over the past few years um, with Tesla and all, all the stuff going on. Yeah. Um, so everyone is just confused, like what are stocks? And so obviously we're going to get into that. Um, first, I'd love to hear about your story, but just to, to give a little bit of pre to listeners, we've got a little bit of a script here where we're going to take you guys through a journey. We're going to create a fake company and we're going to take you through the journey of all the different options you can do with investing in stocks. We're going to talk about brokerages, the whole thing. And we're going to keep it as simple and as surface level as possible so that you can understand and hopefully get some value out of this. Um, so let's jump into it. What, what was your story after high school and like what are you currently up to? Like how did you get into this world? So... Byron, I went to Woolooware High School uh, down here in Sutherland Shire, which is a, a public school, and I was no good at school. I actually failed um, my UAI, I think it's called, what's it called now? ATAR. Yeah. ATAR. So I got 49 and a half, which is well less than anything that you need to get into university. Um, so 49 and a half out of 100? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that means I'm in the bottom 50 yeah, percentile, right? So I bombed out. I, I got my HSC, but I, I did no good. And I'd always wanted to get into finance. I'd always wanted to become a stockbroker um, because growing up, I was very close to my grandfather, who was a very avid uh, investor. Uh, and every afternoon, he used to sort of look after me after school. And my job was to pull up his portfolio. Back then, it was on what's called the teletext. Now, you wouldn't know what the teletext is. No. It was sort of like uh, you could pull it up on your TV and, and get like live pricing for stocks. So my job in the afternoon when my grandfather was looking after me was to pull up the value of his portfolio. And I still remember one day when I was growing up, I was probably about 10 years old. He said, Mitch, if you could pick a stock on the screen, what would it be and why? And I picked Bendigo Bank for some reason. I think I just like the name of it. And he pulled me up on it and he said, well, what about its its um, its yield? What, what's, what's its dividend? What's it paying? And of course, I had no idea mm. what he was talking about. Yeah. And that's how I sort of learned about it. And um, that afternoon, he actually picked up the telephone in front of me and he called his stockbroker and he bought $10,000 worth of Bendigo Bank. Really? And that whole process blew me away and it got me hooked from there. I couldn't stop checking the prices of his portfolio yeah, in, every yeah. afternoon. So that's where I got the sort of passion from it. Um, finished high school, bombed out. My only avenue uh, to get into an investment bank or in, into a brokerage firm uh, was by getting a job in the back office, okay? Starting at the bottom. Mm, and working your way up. Working my way up, I exactly. That was my only avenue. And I highly recommend that avenue to anybody who drops out of high school and wants to get into finance, you, mm. you can do it. You can do it that way. So no, my, no my, degree. No, no degree. Straight into oh, it. Yeah. Straight into it. Yeah. yeah I mean, my <laughs> first it. job, I was at. I was a a tea tea guy, right? Yeah, you a, tea, tea, a, tea, tea. a tea bitch. Yeah, yeah. That's, I <laughs> that was that. my first job, right? And um, and it was in the back office. It, but my strategy was, I went to five recruiting firms, right? And I said, I just want a job in any brokerage firm. I don't care which one it is. I don't care what hours I work. Mm. And, and so I had five recruiting firms fighting to get me a job, right? It's in their best interest. So anyway, I got a, I got a job at JP Morgan Chase mm -hmm. in 2004 in the back office. Uh, and it was, a, it was a night desk job. So my job was to basically, it was a reconciliation job, pretty mundane, boring job. And my shift would start at lunchtime and finish at about midnight. Mm -hmm. So long hours. Um, I did that for about four years. And then I got uh, asked to go over to Macquarie Bank um, as a junior, a desk assistant on their international equities desk. The word equities, just another way of saying shares or stocks. Mm, yeah. You know, um, so I moved over to Macquarie Bank in 2000, I think it was 2007, 2008, um, as an assistant, uh, another glorified coffee bitch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then basically I, I worked my way up, you know, I, I got, got my license, which is, it's pretty easy to get if you apply yourself. Um, and then I became a, a licensed stockbroker in 2009. And then I just started to build a, a book of clients. Mm. And so that's how I got into it. Yeah, awesome. That's a great story. I love that. I didn't realize, like, I love the grandfather aspect of it. Like yeah. I was the same when I was about 11 and I made my first video, which got me into filmmaking. Mm. Man, I was editing it. I watched it 20, 30, every day I'd go home and I'd watch it. Like I was addicted to it. Same as you, yeah. you'd go home and you'd check to, to see a Bendigo Bank stock yeah, was going. It's yeah, like, when you get hooked on something, it's um, it, it's it's amazing. It's you so know? much fun, yeah. And I guess that's a sign of not necessarily passion, but like something you're obviously very interested in. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. I love the markets moving. You know, there's money to be made, certainly money to be lost. You know, mm. my, my first trade, I, I think I, I saved up $1,000 and I lost it all. I, yeah. I, I bought options. I think I was 16 years old. I set up a brokerage account in my mother's name, a, an options account, and I put it all on one stock. And of course, <laughs> I, I blew that in about a week. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's a lot of a lot of uh, lawns that you, meet, you need to mow to, to mm. make up for that. A thousand bucks when you're 16 is a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Awesome. So that's kind of who you are and you've been doing that. And now you're into more of the education space. Yeah, that, that's right. So I, I left uh, Macquarie Bank in 2015 to start my own company, uh, Initial Capital. And we just raise money uh, for stocks that want to list on the stock exchange, which is called an IPO, an mm. initial public offering. So we raise capital for other companies. But look, I really get kicks out of educating people about the stock market. There's just so much misinformation out there. Yeah. And I believe that stockbrokers and financial advisors, they try to make 
the stock market sound difficult and complicated on purpose, mm. right? To try and confuse people so, so that you'll use money. them to yes. pay them money, right? Yeah. But there's nothing complicated about stocks. It is so easy. And if I can do it, anybody can do yeah. it. And that's what we're going to get into right now. Let's we're going to get into um, how is it so easy? And let's, in, in terms like IPO, like yeah. I think we've all heard of IPO. Like yeah. oh, Airbnb IPO to yes. months ago. Like what does that mean? Airbnb is around, it's been around for five years. What, what does it mean? Like, um, so we'll get into stuff like that. Absolutely. And we're going to start off with, I guess you wanted to create a fake company and take us through the journey. So did you want to tell us a little bit about this company? Yeah, I, I think I think we should. Um, we'll just create a fictitious company. We'll call it the Standard Manufacturing Company. Yeah. Okay, so I guess the, the first thing to, to clarify really is, is what are stocks, right? Mm. Let's start from the start. Now, you might find, a lot of your listeners might find some of these explanations pretty elementary, but... You know, some people might not know the exact difference between what a stock is and what a bond is. So no one, no one knows unless they've actively gone out to educate themselves. Right. So let's start right there. All right. So the stock of a company just represents the ownership of that company. Mm. So if you own a share of stock in a company, let's call it the standard manufacturing company, well, then you own a piece of that company. Yes. Right. So you own a piece of its plant, its production, a piece of everything in that company. Yeah. If the standard company has a thousand shares of stock, and you own 10 shares, well, then you own a hundredth of the company mm. or 1% of it, mm. right? Which means you own you own 1% of, of everything in it. Now, some companies have only a few shares of stock and a few owners, while others, big corporations like McDonald's and Tesla have millions of shares of stock mm. and hundreds of thousands of owners or stockholders. For example, I own all the stocks in my company because I'm a tiny company and that's it's right. like I'm the one shareholder. Yeah, th- that's right. So you as, as the as the owner of the company, you could have made a million shares of, of your company. It doesn't mean it's worth anymore. Mm. You can yeah. divide that how many times you want, right? Yeah. So that's that's what stocks are. So I think so to clarify that, if there's a company and they have 100 stocks Yes. and you own 10 of those stocks, yes. you own 10% of that company. That's right. And you own 10% of everything in it. Now, why would we get that? We would buy that because we think that company is going to increase in value. So look, why does anyone buy stocks? For the same reason that anyone might want to own a business or to have a stake in one, to make money, mm. right? So when the standard company makes money, a part of its earnings will likely be plowed back into the business. Mm. And a part of it, will be paid out as dividends to the owners or stockholders. So, so much for every share of stock, right? If you own 1% of the company, you get 1% of the dividends. Yes. Same, if you own 10% of the company, you get 10% of the dividends. That's right. You're entitled to 10% of the dividends. So, how big a dividends is probably the next question that I get asked a lot, Yeah. right? And that depends primarily, of course, on what a company earns, right, in any given year. Now, most companies try to pay dividends at a regular annual rate, such as $1 or $2 or $5 for every share of stock. Mm. In in good years, that regular rate may be increased or extra dividends declared. But in in bad years, that dividend may be cut or eliminated, just like we've seen with the banks, right? So what we're saying here is if you own 10% of... A company, yes. let's say it's one dollar stock, so 10, 10 stocks. Yes. Ten shares, sorry. Yep. Ten shares of that stock. Yep. And that goes and it was one dollar. Yep. And in one year it goes from one dollar to two dollars. Yep. You've essentially doubled your money in that one year. Well, yeah, that's that's if the stock price changes like that. Yeah. But that's the, the, there's a big difference between an investor and a speculator, which mm. we will get into yes. in, in this, you know, in, in this uh, I guess script that we've that I've helped write to explain all of this to yeah. you. So I guess another thing to clarify is a company's board of directors. You may have heard of a board of directors Mm. before. So those board of directors decides what dividends will be paid and when. And to clarify, dividends is the money the company makes that they pay out to their... Uh, Yeah, so it's a company's earnings that they pay out to their owners, their shareholders, right? As a thank you, basically, for buying investing in their company. It's just what you get. It's your incentive for owning the company. You know, you you own your company. If it makes a profit, well, you you pay yourself a dividend Mm. on top of your salary. Mm. Yeah, awesome. All right, so that's that's the incentive of, of going out and, and buying it. So the company's uh, board of directors decides what dividends will be paid uh, and when. Um, the directors are the real heads of the company, right? The president and the other officers are, respo- are responsible to the directors for their management of the company. So that's that's it. Um, what, what other securities are there? I often get asked, like so far we've just been talking about common stocks mm. 
But in, in addition, some companies have what's called preferred stock, usually offered at you know $100 a share. These stocks carry generally carry a set dividend rate, say of $4 a year, right? And they're always, well, they're not always, they're often originally offered at $100 a share. Now, preferred stocks are not as common as what's called common stocks. And just real quick, what's some examples of common stocks? Well, like every stock that you see on the ASX 200. Which is, and what's ASX 200? The Australian Stock Exchange. Yep. They're all common stocks. Yeah. Okay. So preferred stocks is not as, not as common. You don't mm. often hear about it, but the owners get a first claim on whatever may be left of value if that company should fail. Mm. So this is just another type of security. Okay. And then there are bonds. Mm. Right. You may have heard of bonds. Yeah. Which are the most stable of all securities. They're usually offered in thousand dollar units. So bonds, bonds are a kind of promissory note, okay? So people who buy a company's bond lend their money to that company. Now for the use of the money, the company pays a set, a set rate of interest, say 3% per year. But this is the big difference. Unlike, unlike stockholders, bondholders are not part owners of the company. Mm, that's they're the just, big difference. Just, that's the big difference. They're just creditors of the company. Yeah. So that is the difference between what a stock is and what a bond is. Uh, stockholders own part of the company. Bondholders just lend their money to the company. They're creditors, IOUs. Yeah. And the, the only reason they do that because they want the interest? Or why would yeah, they do that, that? That, that, that's right. So th they, th they lie ahead of they lie ahead of, of stockholders on the on the food chain, if you will, if the company is to go into liquidation. Bonds are more stable than stocks, mm. okay? If, if the price of a stock goes down, the price of your bond doesn't go down, mm. right? So that's why it's a lot more stable. It's a lot more stable. Yeah. Exactly. Because you're, you're just getting paid back. You're going to get your money back unless the company Unless bankrupts. the company fails, right? Yes. So they're just corporate bonds. So you can lend your money to, I don't know, you can lend your money to Qantas, for example. And mm. right now, the airline industry is pretty shaky. So mm. you, you would expect a return of, I don't know, 10% for mm. the, for, because it's pretty risky, mm. right? And if Qantas goes down, well, then you can lose all of your money, Yeah. right? And you can't just sell it on the market mm. like you can easily trade you don't stocks. you own anything. Well, you money. own an IOU. Yes. So it's a promissory note. Yeah. Qantas have promised to pay me back. Yeah. So, so the riskier the company, the higher the more the, the higher the rate of interest that you, yeah. you you expect, right? But it's unlikely anyone listening to this is going to get into bonds. Or... Very unlikely. Yeah. Very unlikely. I just wanted to clarify the difference yeah. between the we're, two. We're more interested in the stocks because we yep. want to own a portion of the company. Yep. Um, and look, as we mentioned, stocks can be high risk, high reward depending on the company. Yeah, absolutely. It could be a startup tech company mm. and you're investing in stocks and they could, you know, not exist in two years or they could be the next Facebook. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is the exciting part. That's yeah. why people love it. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I find with this domestic stocks or shares, equities, right? So that's the ASX 200. And then you've got international stocks as well. To be completely honest with you, the ASX, the Australian Stock Exchange, bores the hell out of me. Mm. You know, it's equal to less than 2% of the global stock market and we just don't have the the sexy, exciting companies that the American market yeah. has. Uber, Tesla, right. Airbnb, all those fun... All those yeah. fun, exciting stocks, right? We've got like, you know, Afterpay, which has been sort of the Afterpay's shining star. Afterpay's been amazing. Which has been, which yeah. has been amazing, right? Um, I, you know, I've watched that go from a dollar a share to what is it, 140, something, something like the crazy. Hey, like yeah, that. to clarify, so a dollar to 140. If yeah. you'd invested yeah. when it was a dollar, yeah, you would have. If you bought, if you had a thousand dollars and and you bought in in the IPO, I believe off the top of my head, yeah. it listed at a. You could have bought in the IPO at a dollar a share. Yeah. If you bought a thousand shares, you'd have 140 thousand dollars worth of stock, which now. is insane. And, which is insane. And if we bought it at 100 thousand dollars, you'd be 1.4 mil. Oh wait, uh, no, it, it'd be four, mil. fourteen mil. Fourteen mil. I'm bad at math. Oh, yeah. so am I. I failed high school, mil. as you know. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? And so what, once you, if you bought in at um, and you got 150k, yeah, or 140k, you can now reinvest that in another stock or something. And that's where people can just more money. And they just like scale from there. And so that's the potential. So obviously, that's a unicorn. That's something that's yeah, kind of just skyrocketed. Yeah, and we don't want to. We don't. I want to clarify. So, it's very unlikely that's going to happen to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. It's all sort of you know risk, risk and reward. You know, mm. there's a big difference between uh, investors and, and speculators. So investors buy stocks typically for the dividend yield for for their earnings, and a speculator will buy a, a stock expecting a price to rise. Mm. All right, and that's yeah. that's the key difference between the two. 
but there's nothing wrong or right with either one. You know, there's a lot of so-called punters out there who just speculate and they don't care about the dividends. A lot yeah. of people, old people care about dividends. Yeah, Dividends is more long-term. Well, did... Dividends, yeah, dividends you can use as cash flow, yeah. for example. A lot of retirees live off their dividends, mm. right? Um, I would assume that the majority of your listeners, much like myself, are speculators. We buy a stock because we want to buy it at a dollar because we want to sell it at two or three or four. Yeah, I would be a speculator. Yeah, 100%. Say. There's nothing yeah. right or wrong about either one. Mm. So... Um, uh, so we've covered what are stocks, how big are dividends, what other securities are there, what are stocks worth, right? Um, so the price of a stock, like the price of food or clothing, just depends on how much other buyers are willing, other buyers are willing to pay for it and how cheaply those who own it are willing to sell. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Right, so, so that's what simple. stocks are worth. Yeah. And so, yes, yeah, so how do we explain that? I want to get this, this is an important point I want to get across because yes. it's like how can... Tesla's a classic example because it's yes. always in the news. How can Tesla? How did Elon Musk become the rich? He just became the richest man in the world recently. Crazy. Because he he increased like forty billion dollars over a sh- small amount of time. Yeah. Why is that? It's because he owned a large amount of stocks in Tesla, yeah. and Tesla's stock skyrocketed. Yeah. Or went up, which yeah. means that that large amount of money he owns all went up together. And when you're owning billions of dollars with the stocks, if it goes up by one percent, you've just made you know a shit ton of money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you know you've got you've got Bezos and you've got Elon Musk and, and they they all own huge stakes in these companies and they all get paid you know st- you know s- stock options for part of their rem- remuneration for being directors of the company you know performance options so they get given parts of these stocks and when the value of their stocks goes up well so does their net worth so on paper they're worth more and more as the stock prices go up and mm. that's how they do it. Yeah, and so, but how does Tesla go from, I don't know, I've got no idea what it's at right now, but let's yeah. say it's at $400 to $600. Yeah. How does that happen? How does it just go from one amount to another amount? Right, so the price of a stock at any given at any given time is nothing more than the collective expressions and opinions of the people mm. who are then buying yep. or selling it. So their opinions about the value of that stock so if a number of people conclude that a particular stock is overpriced, well, then they may decide to sell it and the price will probably fall, Yeah. right? If people decide that it's selling at a bargain, well, then they might, may decide to buy it and the price will go up. So this is, I mean, the classic, there's two massive examples I think of, a Blockbuster yeah. and uh, Kodak. Yes. They're two companies that didn't really innovate and then mm. as a result, they started slowly going down. And once you like, get that momentum of going down, everyone pulls out. They pull out of the company because they go, oh, this company's going down. I'm <laughs> pulling out. I want to save my money now. Yeah. I've already lost 3% or I've lost 10%. Let's pull out now. And then everyone starts pulling out and the company goes further and further down to the point where Blockbuster no longer exists and Netflix is now the king. Yeah, absolutely. So companies do change. And if they, if they don't innovate, well, then they can, they can sink. Mm. And it, it, they can enter like a dangerous spiral. A lot of people look at the charts, right, to reference the price of stocks. And once, once you see a trend, other people see the trend and they think they're going to lose money. So they sell. And that just compounds, mm. compounds the selling. You know? Yeah. And so I think because a lot of people say Tesla like it's overpriced. It doesn't make any sense because if you look at their numbers and everything. And I think a big reason to why Tesla stock is so high is because Elon Musk is the founder or he, he runs a company and he's got such a strong personal brand. He People, is a visionary. Yeah, right? he's a visionary. People believe in him. So they go, I want to invest in his company yeah. because if he's running it, then it's going to you know, going to be good. So his personal brand, I think, has massively bought up the price of Tesla yeah. versus something like Ford. I couldn't even... T- oh, Henry Ford started it, who's now dead. I couldn't tell you who runs Ford. I couldn't tell you who runs any other car company. Yeah, 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 it's it's absolutely crazy. Um, you know, it's dangerous also to say that a stock is overpriced and then you know then you short sell it. For example, yeah. with Tesla in particular, there's been a lot of short selling and they've been burnt. So short selling is when you don't own a stock, you borrow it and you sell it, but you have to buy it back at some point of time. Um, so yeah, look, in my opinion, yeah, Tesla's way overpriced, but there's a lot of speculation happening right now. Mm. It's a lot of mums and dads buying it. It's a lot of government stimulus. There's a lot of money flying around. Uh, and you may, it may go even higher. It may get even more ridiculously priced. Yeah. And then it might collapse. We, we don't know. This is the, you know, the beauty of the stock market. Yeah, like typically what goes up comes down. Yeah. Right? Um, and in, in my view, um, what drives a market is not, and this is whether it be a supermarket, a housing market, um, you know, or a stock market. 
it's not supply and demand what a lot of people think it's people's emotions fear and greed okay so when people get greedy they buy they borrow money that they don't have to buy a stock mm. with stocks we see it in margin loans with houses we see it in, in gearing mm. you know so that's when people get greedy mm. and the opposite is when people get fearful and they they start freaking out yeah when you've got those two combinations people start selling and mm. i i don't know if now's a good time to go into it but i did really want to because i want to make this as wrap it in some stories and examples. That's why I'm bringing up Tesla so people understand. Sure. And I wanted to bring up The Wolf of Wall Street yep. because the, everyone's seen the movie. And I've watched it, you know, two or three times. I didn't understand the first time I watched it what he was actually doing. Yeah. Like you watch him like sell and then they're like, they, they're selling on the phone, so they're making all this money. And it's yeah. Like, oh, what's actually going on here? What are they doing? Yeah. And until I realized what they're basically doing is they're finding penny stocks. Yeah. Which, did you want to explain what penny stocks are real quick? Yeah. So in the US, you've got your two exchanges, right? You've got your New York Stock Exchange, the NYSE, and then you've got your NASDAQ. And those both of those two exchanges have requirements. So the New York Stock Exchange, you, your share has to maintain a price of $4 a share, mm. right? The NASDAQ has its own requirement. I don't know off the top of my head what it is, but if you've got a, a penny dreadful stock, right? Just a, which, a, means a, it's worth which means it's worth little. nothing, yeah. right? like my company, yeah, it can still trade. You can still sell your shares to other people, just not on the stock market. It has mm. to be what's called over-the-counter or yeah. OTC, also known as the pink sheets, right? Which is, so the pink sheets are what he uses in the movie. Yeah, oh, okay, right, he, he right, that makes pink, sense. He gets yeah. his pink sheets and he goes, so what's this? And he'd call up people, Yes. he'd sell them penny stocks, yes. which means stocks that are worthless. Yep. He would use his sales techniques. They're like, oh, no, oh this company's got, about to go up. It's about to skyrocket. Yep. Get in now, yep. invest your life savings. And you know what we're, what we're talking about here? Fear and greed, yep. right? He's getting people to go greedy, going, yep. you can double, triple, quadruple your money. And then people go, holy crap, I'm, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put more into this. Yeah. So this is fear and greed. And here's what would happen is all the salesmen would sell the one penny stock. And yes. He'd keep selling it to 50, yep. 50 So he'd pump people. it up. So it, the stock would actually go up in value Correct. because everyone's investing in Correct. it. Correct. But then he would take all the money, like he would take all the dividends. Is that right? No, so what he would typically do, he, he would... I believe this is right. He would he would buy some shares of stock of the company that nobody has heard of. Oh, at a at, tiny at, price. at first, at a tiny price, right? Say say a cent, right? Mm. Then he'd get all of his brokers to get on the phone, and once he's already got a holding, and pump up this company. So it's mm. amazing, right? It's going to make so much money. Everyone's going to get rich. It's gone from one and cent then to a dollar. These, yeah, and then he would sell his shares that he that he's bought back to these, you know, un. Un, you know, the, back to these mums and dads mm. at a much higher price. Mm. But he would, he'd buy it one cent, but he'd sell it five, 10, 20 cents, right? Yeah. 20 times your money. Yeah. In like a very short amount of time. A very short amount of time. And so that's how he- But not only that, he was charging commission. Yeah. Ridiculous, like 50%. 50%. 50%. That's commission. what it was. Yeah. So over the counter markets are not regulated like the New York Stock Exchange. Mm. And that's why he could get away with it for so mm. long. And obviously, this is incredibly unethical. He oh, screwed, he's, he screwed over million, no, not million, people thousands think, of dollars. People think that that Jordan Belfort is this hero, yeah. right? The fact is, he's he's a criminal. Yeah, he ripped off so many people, right, through his scams. Mm. He, he's a criminal mm. at the end of the day. In fact, is if your parents had been scammed by him, oh. would you really look at him the same? That's no, how I look no, at it. No, hundred percent. If my parents had lost their life savings yes. because they invested in one of his stocks and lost it all because he scammed them, essentially, yeah. Yeah. would I still glorify him and look at him? It's look, a, I love the movie. Yeah, the it's movie's a, phenomenal. It's, it's, it, is, it is a great movie. It took eight yeah. years to make. Leonardo DiCaprio, yeah. Martin Scorsese. It's an incredible movie, yeah. but don't glorify him. No, exactly. They actually, I'll, I'll Scorsese actually, made the movie because he wanted to highlight the toxic behavior. He didn't yeah. try to glorify him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I've actually seen him, Jordan Belfort, talk mm. at, at a live seminar, and I, I literally walked out in disgust mm. because there's a room full of stockbrokers who are just idolizing yeah. him, going, yeah, you made so much money. But for every dollar he made, some poor sucker lost mm. a dollar, yeah. right? Yeah, and that's the look. I think the movie's phenomenal. I do think it's shined a very unfortunate light, and uh, people glorify it way too much. A lot of guys want to be the next, you know, Jordan Belfort or yeah. whatever. And look, if you make money in the stock exchange, great, but don't do it by simultaneously screwing over. You can make so much money mm. in stocks, right? But you don't need to screw yeah. someone else over to do it. But that's such a visual. Everyone knows Wolf Wall Street, so that's how he did it. I thought it'd be really cool just to discuss how did he do it. So he he, he bought a to clarify. He went in at one cent, let's say. Yep. Pink sheet. He'd find the stock, buy all his stocks at one cent. Yep. He'd then get all his brokers to call up innocent people. Pump and dump. Yep. He'd say, "Hey, get in the stock. It's about to increase." Yep. The stock would increase. He'd go, "Hey, look, your stock's going up. It's going up." They'd get all excited. He'd then pull out all his 
He'd dump He'd it. sell all his stocks back to people. He'd make lots of money. Yeah. And then that stock would just plummet because it's and actually a keep in mind company. that when he was doing this, the OTC market, the pink sheet market is very opaque. You mm. can't just look at the screen like you can on your Comsec account, your Comsec mm. platform and see the price moving, right? You're going off the prices that these brokers are telling you over the phone. And that's your only visibility over the market. Because this was back in the 80s, right? This is like, yeah, yeah. old school. Yeah. Um, awesome. So that was kind of, I feel like that's a good way of getting our head around you know, how stocks are working and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so that's, so stocks are, to clarify, the stock's worth is based on a lot of different things. It's like basically your no, people's this, perspective. A, a, a stock's worth is nothing more than the collective expressions and, and opinions of people yes. who are then buying or selling it. Yeah. Their value, their, their opinions of the value of that stock. That's yeah. all it's worth. There's nothing tangible. It's got, no, it's got nothing to do with the actual earnings of the company. Mm. Like Tesla's not making so much money, yet I, its I think stock's it's, gone through the roof. I think they're not even profitable yet. I think they're just profitable. Yeah. It's not a stock that I follow so closely, yeah. but... But I mean, look, Tesla's just, everyone knows Tesla. It's yeah, it's a, a great reference stock. point. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's kind of, and look, I think a big reason to why it's so high is because Elon Musk is running the company. He's the richest man in the world. He's, he's a genius. He's, he's a genius. A he's, a very, he's a visionary. A lot of people admire him and they think if he's running the company, then it's going to be a safe stock. And yeah, then, and, uh, yeah, and, and uh, enough I, people believe that, that the stock, the price keeps going up. Keeps going up. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And he's the sort of guy you want running your company. Yeah. He takes risks. He's a smart guy and mm. he pulls it off. Mm. So. Exactly. Um, cool. So let's keep moving. So let's move on. Uh, what's the next part of the stock journey? So look, I think we should talk about you know the barriers to entry. A lot of people, yes. you know, assume make the mistake of thinking that it's difficult to buy and sell stocks because they hear all the, all of the lingo and all of the jargon. And hopefully, I've helped sort of uncover that so mm. far. So far, all we've said is a stock is a piece of a company. Yeah, that's that you all can it invest is, right? in. There's bonds, which you don't really have to worry about don't too much. Don't have to much. worry about bonds. Dividends is what the company pays you. As earnings, pays out to yeah, the owners. as right? earnings. Yeah, we've talked about the company's board of directors decides what, yeah. what, you know, what dividends will be paid and when. We've talked about why the prices change, mm. right? Um, simple stuff. Pretty simple yeah. stuff. Like The stock market is simple. And I think a lot of people don't start investing because they think that it's difficult and complicated. And I'm telling you, it's not. Mm. You know, mm. so don't let that put you off. Also, another huge perceived barrier to entry is that you need a lot of money to start a share portfolio, yes, right? These days, many brokers in the US and I think here in Australia now offer what's called zero dollar account minimums, yeah. meaning that you can literally start a share portfolio with the loose change in your pocket. That's what I did, right? If and you, I, I got a managed fund. If you've got fifty bucks in your in your bank account. Go out and buy fifty bucks worth of, you know, worth of Amazon or whatever. Yeah. You can buy fractional shares now, but you, you don't need a lot of money just to get started. And I'm yeah. telling you, it's the best feeling. Can I? I'll just say because I I don't really I'm not in stocks yet. I want to get into it once I earn more money. But yeah. I just put my instead of putting it in a savings account, I put yeah. it in a managed fund. Amazing. And a managed fund is just where you own a small piece of a lot of companies. So it's a lot. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. That that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. So you've got the option of either being a stock picker, which I find more exciting, way more exciting for sure. Or you can still get exposure to the stock market by letting a fund manager buy your stocks. For example, mm. the world's probably best known and most successful fund manager is Warren Buffett, yep. right? The Oracle of Omaha. Yeah. And he owns a company called Berk, well, he doesn't own, he runs a company mm. called Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway in the States is just a, just a managed fund. So you can buy a share of Berkshire Hathaway and let Warren Buffett decide what other stocks he's going to buy for you, mm. right? Yeah. It's a managed fund. Yeah. So for example, I use a company called Spaceship. Yes. Which is a, a kind of invest in tech companies. Okay. And instead of my putting my money in a savings account, which right now is like what, 1.5%, yep. 1.7%, yep. which is basically nothing. Yeah. Um, you can put it in a managed fund and yeah. it's relatively safe because I, so I have a tiny, tiny percentage in Tesla. If Tesla stocks right, uh, tank, tanks right now, yeah. I'm also in 50 other companies. Yeah, so it's, it's certainly uh, more diversified. Yeah. I think there's a common misconception out there that the more diversified you are, the better. Mm. I have the opinion, right? This is just my opinion that I guess the more concentrated you are, the better. Mm. If you can get like, imagine if you put all of your money into Tesla two years ago, mm. right? You, you would have made so much more money than if you had a, picked 50 stocks or well, that's 100 it. stocks. It's, it's just managed fund is lower risk. It's lower, lower risk, reward. lower reward. And then what we're talking about, buying one stock at a time is high risk, high reward. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Higher risk, higher reward. Yeah, yeah, it is. And so that's, that's, true. that's the game. That's, that's, that's this the is story. where people get, you know, get a kick out of it. Yeah, that's that's right. Exactly. And, but I, if you can get into a managed fund, so I use a company called Spaceship. I'm not selling you to no, telling you to use it, but yeah. I just recommend having checking it out. There's lots of other companies. It's so easy. 
oh my God, you just set up an account, anything under $5,000, you pay zero fees on. Yeah. And you just click on what you want to do, bang, bang, bang. I, you can even, I automate my money from my bank account into it every, every two weeks. Yeah. I just invest into there. And I, I think that is awesome because I think that you'll find that once you're financially invested into something, um, you will check it more yeah. and, and you will find out about that company. What makes them special? Yeah. Who are its management? What are their products like? Mm. Is this something that I love? And you know, it's the best place to start. Yeah. And I'm up $600 more. and it's been in there for like a month. And it's like, if it, was, if it was my savings account, I'd be up what, $3? Yeah. And, and so and look, and that might go down. So it doesn't mean I own it because I haven't pulled out yet. Yeah. But just by putting it in a simple account like Spaceship, there's lots of other, t- there's Ra- Rays as well. There's lots of other apps yeah, there's, there's and stuff. There's, it's so it's easy. It's a great way to, to dig your toes in the water and just get started as a young person. Yeah. Um, and then there's other companies. But um, I guess, did you want to talk about the barrier to trading stocks as opposed to managed funds? Yeah, so people people often make the mistake of thinking that it's difficult. And honestly, the way that I learned how the stock market worked was through the ASX website. They've got free courses mm. and it'll take you about an hour for each course. And I highly, re- highly recommend that everybody does it. You just go mm. to asx.com and download their free yeah. courses. It's a piece of cake. You don't have to buy awesome. some entrepreneurs. No, your, don't pay anyone. Don't. $9.97. No. Just go on the ASX go website. Go on the ASX website. Yeah. You know, it's it's very easy. Yeah, awesome. And so once you've done that, I mean, they can go, they can find out there. So There's, once, okay, so the first thing to do is really to upskill yourself. You can do that for free. Go to the ASX website. The next thing you will need is a brokerage platform. And assuming that you want to buy and sell your stocks online and not go through a financial advisor, which yeah. is 98% of people these days. Yeah. Which is right? the beauty of the internet. Which everything. is the beauty of the internet. Technology costs have come right down. You can mm. trade almost free. Mm. Uh, the next thing you'll need is a brokerage account. So you've, you've got to, you've really got to make the decision now. And this is assuming that the majority of your listeners are Australian. Mm. Are they? Uh, I mean, honestly, we're mix. A mix. Be, be mix. Yeah, okay. A mix. If, if you are listening from Australia, you've got the decision to make whether you want to buy and sell stocks here locally on the ASX or invest internationally. Yep. I highly recommend that you open your brokerage platform that can invest internationally yep. because the ASX is less than 2% of the global markets. Mm. Uh, the US market, I think it now up to like 55%. 55? No, I'm, I'm not kidding. Yeah, it's like 55 oh, This is why America is such a beast. Well, because they've got beast. sexy companies that yeah, make yeah. a lot of money and they're full of innovation. You've mm. got your Amazons, you know. So, um, yeah. Oh, I, Clubhouse now? Yep. You know? oh, well, I, yeah, absolutely. I, I know everyone wants to invest in Clubhouse when it, you know. When Are they, they listed? I, I haven't, no, no, they're not listed. They're not they, listed. But they're they're when they list, they will list on, you know, on one of the American yeah. exchanges, but right? But just VCs, right? Everyone's wanting to get in. And everyone just, wants to get in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so look, my my advice, take from it what you will, is that you give yourself more opportunities by opening a, by opening a brokerage platform that will let you invest internationally. Mm. So the US, Europe, Asia. Yeah. Okay. So the best platforms, in, in my view, you've got locally here, you, you've got Stake. I was about to say, I'm on Stake. Okay. Stake's cool. Stake's amazing. Stake's yeah. cool. And I'm obviously not affiliated by them. Yeah. I just like their service. They're, they don't charge commission. Mm. It's important to highlight that nothing in this world is free. Yeah. Okay. Course. They're still making some money and they're entitled to. They make it on their foreign exchange spreads. Yeah, they're a startup, you know? Yeah. In Australia. Yeah. They're yeah. Like, yeah. I've met the directors. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah, um, no, they're, they're, look, I've heard very good things about Stake. Yep. Um, so you open up a brokerage platform. Let's say you've done it with Stake, then you fund it, you, you fund it with your, your pocket change, and then you start having fun. Yeah. Put put some money in, and then you just go in, and you literally just click on the companies you want to buy, Yeah. and away you go. It's, it's so easy. It's it, mind-blowingly easy. And it's easy is, to do. It's hard to get right. Yes. But when the market as a whole is moving up or down, you, you generally, you either, it's easy to make money. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to cover is is what's called a bull market and a bear market. Have mm. you ever heard of that? Yes. So a bull market is just when the average price of all stocks moves up, right? And a bear market is the opposite. It's the average price of all stocks drops because of widespread selling. So if is you're bullish or bearish. 10%? No, no, that's, it doesn't, oh, okay. no, there's no just percent. There is no percent, okay. right? So to be bullish or bearish simply means to believe that stocks will go up or down. Mm. Now it's easy to keep track of whether the market as a whole is moving up or down, 
because almost every you know major newspaper and you know CNBC and, and Bloomberg uh, will report a, a key group of stocks called indexes, mm. right? So here we've got the ASX 200. Uh, in America, you've got your S and P 500 or the mm. Dow Jones, for example. So they're indexes and. The index is moving up, we're in a bull market. If mm. it's moving down, we're in a bear market. There you go. That's it. That's all it is. Yeah. And once again, people will say these words, and as young people, we don't know what they mean. You don't know like, what, what it means. What do you mean bear market? No. You're just saying the market's going down. Yeah, that's it. That's all it is. Yeah. If, 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 the, if the price rise is big enough and lasts for long enough, it's a bull market. Yeah. If it goes down for long enough, it's a bear market. Like that's a, like it. Like a recession man. almost. Yeah, 100, 100. But I think a recession is two negative quarters of GDP. Mm. So you can, you can actually measure that, right? Oh, right yeah, yeah. Once we've had two negative quarters, we're in recession. Once we've had four negative quarters of GDP growth, we're in depression. Mm. But in true stockbroker form, there's no way of measuring this. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Just, let's just make up a ridiculous word to make it sound difficult and complicated. Yeah, 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 great. I mean, that's... Uh that's fantastic because you're right. It's confusing. A bear market, bull, bull market sounds scary. It's like the word bull as well. Like, <sighs> and, and then you see it. the bull in, if you've been to New York, you see that, that yeah, yeah. bull out there, which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so what's the, uh, I guess, the next step moving on? So the next step, so you've, you've saved up you know, your pocket money, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, however much you want to get started. You've opened your brokerage platform. You've been through the ASX and you've you've done the short courses. You know how to trade. Next, you, you need to pick stocks. Mm. Okay. Um, you know, the best way of doing that, I think, is by by utilizing the company's products. You know, Is this something that you like mm. and believe in for Which yourself? Which is why when Airbnb IP, IPO'd, I was like, yeah, yeah I want to get that. I love Airbnb. You love it, great, right? Great and company. this is a great way to invest. Mm. And then you know, and and then you, you read up as much as you can on that on that company. You know, mm. what are, what what's the company's earnings like? How big are the dividends? What's their management like? And you just compare your stock to its competitors. Are they yeah. in any better positions? You know, than, than yours. And I will throw out there. I think it's important when we are st- starting because right now on the journey we're starting to actually invest. Only invest your, what you're willing to lose. Yeah. So so nobody should speculate, right? Which is pretty much what we all are, yeah. unless they can afford to take risks. Mm. Okay, because the the chances of a sudden price change is an inevitable part of any free market, mm. whether it be a market for food or stocks or commodities or any other market, mm. right? So I always tell people to investigate the company first, then invest, and then to keep on investigating. Mm. You've got to maintain a, a close, continuous study of the market, you know, of all times. Mm. A lot of people buy stocks put them away and forget about them i personally think that's bad business i could be wrong here but but things change Mm. blockbusters now gone out of business right yeah yeah you've got to the stocks you're investing in if you want to be serious about it you've got to be keeping up to date with companies Uh, and uh, at least bare minimum just doing some readings checking out what they're doing keep your finger on the pulse yeah you know by by reading yeah awesome and so we're going to come is steak and I've heard eToro, I think that's no, international. No, no, stay clear of eToro. Oh, really? Absolutely. There we go. Why do you think? I just get ads on YouTube all the time. I haven't oh, used it. you know why you get ads on YouTube? No, probably because I looked at certain No, videos. because they, they can spend so much to acquire a new customer. It's something like a thousand. I know the CEO of Plus 500, right? Mm. Which is which is eToro's competitor. Mm. Plus 500 are the biggest CFD provider in, in the world. And you... The, qu- the cost to acquire a new customer for those companies is about a thousand bucks a person. Wow, okay. Right, so they're spending so much money. And the reason they can afford to do that because the average customer spends more money with them. Yeah. Now, with the, the, here's the problem. With eToro, you think that you're buying stocks, right? Mm. But you're not. What do you mean? You're buying contracts for difference. You're not, you're not a part owner of the company. Wow. You're buying the price difference. If um, I had no yeah. idea. Right? So, because I, I, I haven't used it, but if I had used it, I, yeah, probably, I probably so, wouldn't have researched so it. So, CFDs, contracts for difference, is another type of security, right? So, we've talked about stocks, we've talked about bonds, and now we're talking about CFDs, which is what you're given when you open an eToro or Plus 500 account, which is, it's even worse than, it's not like it's speculation to the max, mm. right? So you're just gambling. You are a glorified gambler. You're not even an owner of the company. Mm. So that's why I recommended Stake, mm. who to be ultra clear, I'm not affiliated with. Yeah, yeah. You can go through another cool company is Saxo Bank, S-A-X-O, and they all offer free 
demo accounts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so a demo account. Yes. We get into this. Yes. This is where you get fake money to play with, right? Yeah. Yes. So all of these companies, this is part of their. Uh, this is what the sales process. This is what if you're listening, do this. Get a demo. Highly account. recommend that you do this. So if you've got a pen and paper, I'd write these three companies down. So I would write down Stake, and that's S T A K E. I yep. would write down Saxo Bank, S A X O B A N K, mm-hmm. and the brokerage platform that I use is called Interactive Brokers. Mm-hmm. Okay, and these are three, well, interactive brokers in Saxo are massive. Now, the, the great thing about are all these- Are they just Australian? No, okay, uh, Saxo Bank, right. I've been to their headquarters actually, are in Denmark, Copenhagen. Okay, awesome. Right, Danish bank. So anyone can get into these? Anyone, doesn't matter where you live in the world, you will be able to open an account with Saxo Bank or interactive brokers. Great. Stake, I believe, is just an Aussie company. It's Aussie, yeah. Right? Yeah. I would, the, the best place to start is to go to their website, download a, a demo account and they'll give you, I think it's 50,000 US dollars of play money, of yeah. fake money. And then you can literally go in and buy and sell stocks online yeah. risk-free. And it's cool. It's a great way of learning. Yeah. You know? you, and can you do this under age? Like if you're under 16? I mean, I'd, you don't have to give them your driver's license. You can put in a ficti- fictional name, right? Yeah, put right. Put in a fake number. Yeah. This I mean, is a demo account. It's not real money. It's fake money. And it's so play you, money. You get $50,000 fake yeah. money yeah. to play with. And if in a, you can invest it into companies. And if the company goes up, you yeah. get more fake money. Yeah, you can so, pay. It's called paper trading. Yeah. And it's just a great way of learning. And I, you can, I think Because the thing is, it's look, we can get in with, if we have $500 in our account, we can start trading. Yeah. But it's not as exciting as having 50K or that money to play with. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think it's actually a million dollars of of fake money. Yeah, you know? it doesn't really matter. It really. doesn't really matter. It's fake money. Yeah, um, but it is a great way just to test out the platform and see which one is right for you, mm. right? Test out the bells and the whistles and the fees and the charges of each broker. Yep. Off the bat, Saxo Bank is a, an easier platform to use. If you're new, probably go to Saxo Bank. Mm. I use interactive brokers uh, because there's more sort of bells and whistles, more charts and-, yeah, yeah. and um, you, know you know what you're doing. <laughs> Well, nobody really knows what they're doing. Let's be completely <laughs> yeah, honest. True. And I'm a I'm a qualified licensed stockbroker. And to be honest, I don't even know what I'm doing. Well, let's get on that because I've seen Warren Buffett and Tony Robbins and these guys say, yes. "Look, nobody knows what's because I read Tony Robbins did a book, Unshakable or something. I haven't read it, but I've seen it. But he interviewed like the top investors in the world. Yes, and he just basically the whole book was about them, just interviewing them, and yes. every one of them was just like, "Look." I got no idea what's happening. No, one, so, no one can predict if a stock's going to go up or down. I'm so glad that you said that. You know, um, it's so true. Yeah. Nobody really knows. Look, I sound like I know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's probably from being a stockbroker. But at the end of the day, you, I don't know whether the stock market's going to go. I've been thinking the stock market has it will be selling off for years because we've been in the longest bull market in history. The market bull since, is going up. Bull's going yeah. up. Since the depths of the JSE in 2009, when I started to become a stockbroker, the market more or less has been going up, right? And I just keep thinking it can't go up any higher, mm. but I've been wrong for so long yeah. now. Right? And has COVID affected that? Yeah, so in March last year, 2020, when COVID came in, <laughs> I made the huge mistake of telling all of my clients who are, who are invested in the market, oh, don't stress, yeah. don't worry. It's this just is just a, another bird flu, yeah, yeah. another swan flu. Yeah. We've been through this before. Yeah. It, it'll be one or two days sell off, the market will shake it off. Mm. No, nah, I was so wrong. Yeah. The market got hammered. ASX down like 30%, you mm. know, the US market's down 30%. And since then, the markets have, of course, recovered and all of the major indexes are more or less at all-time highs right now. Yeah, which is actually an important... So in Tony Robbins' book, when he says real simple investing, if you yeah. just invest in the S&P 500 in America... Yeah, yeah, so which is your top 500 companies. Yeah, and that's just... Over the past 100 years, that's just been going up 10%. Yeah, on yeah. On average, there's been years where it's gone down and stuff, but yeah. on average, over the past 100 years, that's gone up 10%. So if you just... If that's all you did, just invest in S&P... S- what is it? S&P, S&P 500 companies... Yeah. And hold for long term. Yeah. That's this really is simple such strategy. a simple way of yeah. investing. And if you don't have the time to keep your finger on the pulse and be checking these individual stocks, yeah. but you still want exposure to the market, the cheapest and the easiest way of doing it is to buy what's called an ETF, an exchange traded fund, which is passive investing, right? Where you're just, you, you can buy one stock of the S&P 500, which effectively you're owning a fraction of 500 companies. Mm. And you get exposure to the market as a whole, right? And you can average in, Right, you don't have to sell everything and buy it today. You can buy a thousand bucks worth of S and P five hundred today, a thousand bucks next month, a mm. thousand bucks in six months. Just keep right, so if the market gets hammered, you're averaging in your average cost 
you know, it, it's not it's not what it is today. It's it's average. Mm. So but it's my, a, po- my point about why I bought at the S and P because yes. you said COVID hit, everything yes. dropped thirty percent, but yes. it's recovered. Yes. It always recovered. It always goes up. It always goes down. It's always going to come up and down. Yeah, it, when you've got those amount of companies and stuff. So markets move in cycles. They always mm. have, and they always yeah. will. There's peaks and there's trough, and and what causes markets to move really is human emotions, mm. fear and greed. As we mentioned, okay? earlier. As, as we mentioned earlier, we're really in uncharted territory now, right? Um, where once upon a time, uh, the, the 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 height of the stock market would be very correlated to the health of the economy. Yeah. If the economy was doing great, the stock market would be doing great. Not anymore. The economy's screwed up. The economy's in tatters. This unemployment has gone through the roof with COVID. Um, Consumer spending has stopped. Like people are saving, people are scared, people Mm. are saving money, right? Um, So you would think that the stock market would be down, but no, we're almost at all time highs. And and why is that? So the tech company Spaceship, right? Yes. Managed fund, they had a 55% return last year. Yeah, that's it's, insane. Yeah, it's, it, it for is for a managed fund like that. Yeah, it, it is crazy. They are investing in the right stocks for COVID, right? Yeah. Plenty of people at home using the internet, you know, ordering off Amazon because they don't want to go to shops. Yeah, right. So this now, is I'm not a, saying it's going to be fifty five percent again this year, which is a mistake people will make. They'll see that number and go, "Oh, people return. make the mistake of thinking that past performance is any yes. indication of future performance, yeah. which it is not." Mm. What well, may have been a good buy last year or even last month may not be a good buy next year mm. or next month, right? So you've got to keep your finger on the pulse. Um, so yeah, longer the short of it, like the, the health of the economy right now is in tatters, um, but the stock market is all time highs. Mm. And that is because, uh, this is just my view here, this is not factual information. Mm. That is because central governments, like you know, the RBA, for example, has printed so much money called stimulus to get the the economy and moving. And the Royal again. Bank of Australia, yeah, the RBA, yeah, yeah, that's right, yep, yep, um, has you know we're getting job keeper and job seeker, so people are still getting paid, and the economy is ticking along, is moving, and they're mm. buying stocks with it, right? So that's pushing artificially pushing the price of stocks up. Mm. Well, here's my take. I think. Australia is in an incredible position where our economy could rise yeah. while every other economy in the, on the planet goes down because we don't have COVID. Well, we've got it, but very minor. Yeah. Australia and New Zealand are, ve- are very lucky because we're islands. We have very small amounts of COVID. I think we're out of the recession now. So while we're kind of coming up, mm. England and America are just and Canada, they're just skyrocketing down with 50,000 cases a day. Yeah. So I think we're in a position where we could actually become quite a powerhouse. We're in a super exciting position or oh, this is a great opportunity for us to move manufacturing back to australia yes, right and create jobs instead of china yeah well we can't manufacture as cheap as china because we've got minimum wages mm. um and but ethical. <laughs> you said it yeah i said it I'm <laughs> <out to> see. <laughs> we're in a, a great position to uh, bring manufacturing back to australia we've got so many great commodities here whether it be your metals you know your, your iron ore gold mm. uh, but we've also got great commodities like you know sugar and and wheat and you know we can produce yeah. everything here and we have more sun than any other country That's we sh- i think we should be the leading country for solar energy like well, uh, uh, we have uh, so much sun uh, uh, absolutely yeah, definitely. You know, solar energy is, is great. It can be expensive to put in place. Yeah, and but when, it's going to get cheaper as the technology grows over the years. And you know who's going to benefit from that? Tesla. Yeah. You well, know, he, got he, Elon he, Musk creating all of those. He owns Solar City as he, well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. But I mean, if he benefits it, that's great because the world's going to benefit from that, regardless if you like Elon Musk or not. Solar he's, energy. Well, is look, a good he's thing. Mo- moving in the right direction. Clean well, energy. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Um, so. <sighs> Man, we've covered a lot. This has been great. I hopefully, you know, hopefully people got have so far gotten value out of this and have explained things clearly. Mm, I think so. Is there um, any final things? I guess in this journey of a company, we've gone through. We understood. We understood um, how what a stock is. Yeah, how so, stocks are prices determined. So you've opened opened your brokerage platform. You've put money into it. Um, maybe maybe you didn't even do that and you're just playing with fake money. With with fake money. First thing that you're going to see, I just want to quickly touch on this. When you open your brokerage platform, that will be connected to the stock exchange, okay, which will update with live pricing. So you'll see a list of all of the stocks available to trade. Mm. You'll see Tesla. You'll see our stock, Standard Manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. And what you're going to see is the high and the low prices of the day. So you can see the highest price at which that stock is traded and the lowest price. 
But you'll also what you'll also see what's called the bid and the offer. Mm. Okay, so the bid will be on the left hand side, and this is a lift. To, the, the the bid it basically uh, is the price at which the buyers are willing to pay for your stock, and the offer is the price at which the sellers are willing to sell the stock. Mm. Okay, so that's your bid and your offer. Now suppose you want to buy a hundred shares of Standard Manufacturing. Okay, and the, it's quoted as twenty five dollars bid and twenty five dollars and a quarter offered. Okay, which means um, twenty five dollars is the best price that anyone's willing to pay, and twenty five dollars and twenty five cents is the lowest price at which anyone is willing to sell. Mm. Now, all you need to do, Byron, is decide how much you're willing to pay for that stock. So you've got the choice of either creating what's called a market order. This is where people get stuck. You've got a market order, which is an order for immediate execution when the order reaches the floor of the exchange, yeah. regardless of how that price may have changed. So if you put in a market order for 100 shares of standard manufacturing, it might get triggered at $26. And so you, but you say you want to trigger it at $26? You say market. You say, I want to buy this at the best price uh, that yeah. prevails when the order reaches the exchange. So a market order will guarantee you a fill. It will guarantee that you'll buy 100 shares. Mm. Okay. Yeah, and that's but, because the market order today was twenty five dollars. Yeah, but in in four seconds time, when the order reaches the floor of the exchange, it may have gone up to twenty six or twenty seven, and that's yeah. the price you pay. Yeah. Alternatively, you've got what's called a limit order, where you can instruct your brokerage platform only to buy if the stock is available at say twenty four dollars fifty mm. within any time of with any period of time that you specify. So if this price of standard manufacturing goes from 24 down to 24.50, well then your broker will execute that order for you. So and I'll can, sell. Well, sorry. And they'll sell it when it if it hits if it drops to a certain point they'll sell. Yeah. Well, if they point. your broker will then buy that stock for you. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. At, at, off somebody else who's willing to sell it to you yeah, at, yeah. at 24.50. Yeah, but is there scenarios where you might own? 100 shares or something, and when it drops to a yeah, certain yeah. point. Yeah, so limit orders are all, can also be used in selling stocks, mm. not just buying, mm. okay? So a key takeaway here, I guess, is that a limit order, a market order will guarantee you a fill, and a limit order will guarantee you a price, but neither of them will guarantee you both. Mm. Yeah, awesome. And so that's the kind of little stuff that you can just, little technical stuff. When You're going to learn on the it. ASX website, this sort of stuff. Yeah. But like... I speak to people and like, I don't actually know how to place the trade. I don't know what the bid is and I don't know what the offer is. And it is literally so simple. Mm. Yeah, it's so simple. Awesome. I did want to, I guess, is there any final thoughts in this metaphor that we're kind of going into with companies before I move on to one other topic? Sure. Uh, are there any final things you want to get across? But I guess once I've started playing with the fake money, like I think it's a great way to start for young people. Just start playing with some fake money. Just get started. I would recommend don't use a savings account. Use a managed fund. Um, if, at bare minimum, put your money in something so it's not just sitting in an account. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't ever put anybody off buying direct shares into a company. Mm. You know, you might really like uh, the next afterpay. Mm. You know, and if you really like something, then invest in it. Yeah. You know, um, but if you if you if you want to take a safer route, you can just go down a managed fund. But you can be a punter and, and buy individual stocks. Uh, no, no, my wrong opinion, with that. do both. Do you, you can do both. I put, I put the money, look, I'm willing to lose. It doesn't matter for me. I'll put a lot of money in the managed fund because I know that's relatively safe. Because yeah. for it to lose that, I'd have to have 50 companies tank at once. Oh, ab essentially. Ab ab absolutely. And it means that you don't have to watch individual companies yeah. all day long. Yeah. Right? And so that's quite safe. But then I want to have some money on the side to play with and invest in single companies here and there. Yeah. And managed fund for me is long term. Like when I say long term, we're talking 5, 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah. Like you yeah. want to keep your money in there because if that has a regular return, and like we could throw out numbers. Like actually, yeah. I think I had a, a, a stat and it was like Warren Buffett, if he had started investing from 18 to 60, he'd be only worth like 50 million. But because he started investing from 11 to 90, he's yeah. worth like 60 billion. Yeah. Because it's time in the market. Yeah. 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 They say that you don't don't try and time the market. It's more time in the market. Yeah. You When's know? the best time to invest in a stock now? That's what yeah. I've as well. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, the best time to invest in a stock is when there's blood on the streets. Yeah. And there's not blood on the streets right now. You know, people are greedy in my view. And I think markets move in cycles and I think there'll be great times. There'll be bargains to be had. Mm. But, you know, don't let it put you off. Start chipping away. Mm. It, you don't need thousands of dollars to invest. Yeah. So for long, young listeners, I want to clarify. Get into one of the companies you mentioned. What was the one you recommended? The uh, 
Yeah. The brokerage platform? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so look, if you're in Australia, open an account or try at least try the the, um, the demo account with Stake, Stake S-T-A-K-E. Yeah. If you're offshore, use Saxo Bank, S-A-X-O, Saxo, Bank, Saxo yeah. Bank, or the brokerage platform that I use and prefer, which is called Interactive Brokers. The yeah. only problem is if you're new to this, there might be too many bells and, bells yeah. and whistles. Like you open the brokerage platform and you're like, whoa, yeah. what the hell is this? Why is there so many things moving? Let's stick to the simple ones. So stick Saxo Bank Saxo worldwide. Bank's easy. And start it, open up an account, start trading with some fake money, have some fun, get yeah. into it. And I would also recommend checking out managed funds and there's lots of apps and stuff out there. So just start... Just start tasting the waters. It, we're not going to say you're going to make lots of money at 16, but if you get this habit, you might, in you now, know, you might lose everything at 16, right. like, like I did. Good. My first trade, I lesson. lost everything, lost 100. percent Yeah. But it, it really got me interested. Yeah. You know. Cool. So yeah, let's just get started. That's my advice. Start dipping your toes in the water, and by the time you're 22, 23, you've got all that experience. Now you've got some money, to, serious money to play with. Yeah. Now you've got the experience, and you're not starting from fresh like most people. Oh, uh, absolutely. You've so, got the experience, you've got the knowledge, and don't let anybody put you off with their jargon crap because. Honestly, the stock market is just so simple. Keep it simple. It's simple and no one knows what's really going on. No one knows. <laughs> no one's got any idea. Awesome. And so I wanted to have one more conversation around crypto. Yes. Uh, I thought it'd be a fun thing to talk about. It's very, yeah. hot, very, very hot right now. Bitcoin's so been fluctuating right now. like just unbelievably. <laughs> $40,000 one week to 30000 the next. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on crypto? Is that an opportunity for young people? What are you seeing in terms of that, that world? Yeah, like honestly, in, you're probably just going to think I'm so boring right now. Uh, I'm not into crypto. I actually bought crypto. I actually bought Bitcoin at twelve dollars a coin, and I sold it at thirteen. This is what I'm saying. So everyone always says, "Oh, I, I nearly bought crypto back at um back in 2010. I, I'd, I be a, I'd be a billionaire." It's I like, did. No, because you would have sold it as yes. soon as it went up to you know yeah. fifteen or whatever. Yeah, hundred. Like there's no way you would have held it for six years. Yeah, definitely. That's right. Exactly. Everything's great in hindsight. Um, but the thing with crypto, right, is we're talking before about the difference between investors and speculators. When you're buying crypto. Um, you're you're not buying it for the sake of dividends mm. because crypto can't earn you money. It's not a company. Right? It's not a company. Yeah. You're buying it for speculation, mm. expecting the price to, to rise so that you can sell it at a profit. And that's the only reason. There's nothing wrong with speculating. Mm. I love a punt. Yeah. You know, I'll bet on anything. Um, but it's pure speculation, very risky. And don't do it unless you can afford to take risks. Yeah, only invest with what you're I mean, the easy money's gone, Byron. You can't buy it at 12 bucks anymore. No. It's like 30,000, yeah. 40,000. Yeah. Um, hey, it might go up tenfold from here. I don't that know. Being said, I've got no idea. This time Nobody last has year, any idea. It was like 8,000. Yeah, right. And you know what moves the crypto market? I have no idea, honestly. Supp uh, it's fear and greed. Everything's fear and greed. There you go. That's, that's it. Human emotions. And I think the key to making money on the stock market or the crypto market, the number one key to making money is to have a really good gauge on everybody's emotions. Mm. In December 2018, when Bitcoin was like $25,000 a coin, my Uber driver was telling me to buy Bitcoin. Mm. That's a red flag. When people start punting that normally otherwise wouldn't, Yes. right? That, that means that people are getting greedy, mm. okay? So it, it, is, it, it is a red flag. Mm. And so, and I guess, because the cool thing about crypto is it's 24 seven. Yeah, There's yeah. The stock exchange, which is only open from certain hours. And in Australia, it's a pain in the ass hours. Like Yeah, so like, what is it, 10 a.m. till 4 p.m.? But hey, stocks, yeah. no, well, well, when the ASX closes, I'll start punting in Germany. Oh, there you go. punting in Europe and you can do right. that with Saxo Bank and Interactive Brokers mm. you can punt 24-7 yeah. and then the US market will open and then you can punt the US market yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> if you're really wired on coffee then you know the first market to open of the day will be New Zealand because yeah. because of their time zone mm. they're, they're at the front so there's always it's always a time that you can trade stocks apart from the weekends mm. okay so you can trade New Zealand then Australia and then the rest of Asia so Hong Kong will open up at about 11 o'clock and then you can you can trade, um, you know, some Vietnam if you're a real punter. Mm. And then you'll find that uh, Europe will open in the afternoon and it'll start with, uh, with Germany, then London. And, and, you know, you can trade some pretty cool companies over there. And then about midnight, uh, Wall Street will open. And that's when the real fun begins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, crypto is 24-7. Um, currency is 24-7. So yeah. you can buy and sell. Right. We didn't even get into that. That's probably a bit too overkill, I would say. It's just another speculation. Yeah. Sort of, but you can trade currency pairs all through these platforms. You, you, you wouldn't invest in a currency. It doesn't earn you anything like crypto, but stocks do. So oh, real quick, and, and on my other point, are we? do you reckon Australian dollar is going to go up with 
our comp- I guess our country kind of on the rise while the other countries are on the fall. Okay, so everyone's got a view, and yeah. this is my view. Yeah, this is purely this just is us purely talking. My we're just chatting right now. So we're, uh, last time I checked the Aussie, it was at say seventy seven cents, and you always compare the Aussie against the US yeah. dollar. Yeah. You don't compare it against the yen. So to clarify to US listeners, like. It sucks when you see Australia, uh, American pricing because you've mentally got to go, oh, that's not that's not $100. That's like $130. <laughs> you know, there was a point where the Australian dollar bought $1.10 US. So yeah, it, has, I know. it has been above that. That was not too long ago, was it? A couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Five, six, seven years ago. And everyone in Australia is buying like from Amazon. This is going nuts. They're just like, how do we order anything? Because it's all in US. Theory. Yeah, a- a- Absolutely. What really drives the Australian dollar? So the, the it's all supply and demand, right? Um, and what drives the the Australian dollar is typically commodities, because China, right, um, buys so much of our iron ore mm. and used to buy our coal before before the bans. They need to pay for that in in Australian dollars. Mm. So they're buying all of the Australian dollars, right? Which so inflates the price. Which inflates the price. Yeah. Right. So the price of the Aussie in Australia, the price of the Aussie dollar is tied very much to the price of commodities. So when iron ore is red hot, like it is right now, mm. the Australian dollar will be red hot. Mm. Yeah, awesome. It's. I mean, there's a whole other conversation here, but that's. This is stuff I think we should be learning in school. Like kids, oh, have, kids I, have no idea how does the currency inflate. A, a great question I see all the time is, how can we just can't print more money? Well, we do. That's the problem. America does, don't they? Yeah. So what well, Australia does as well. So when COVID hit, you know, you saw Josh Frydenberg on TV yeah. saying announcing Job Keeper and Job Seeker. That money. 190 billion. Yeah, crazy, right? Yeah. Where's so that money per, come from? Per capita, that's ridiculous. Mm. Uh, that money is just being printed. And um, when when people say printing money, they're not physically printing money. Mm. There is no printer, like they're not turning on the printer. Yeah, yeah. These are, these, these are just zeros in bank accounts mm. that they're lending to people. Money hasn't been actually printed. And, and that causes uh, inflation, right? Inflation, so, uh, you know, inflation is basically, it's, how do I explain inflation? So the price of milk today is at a dollar. The price of milk uh, next year will be at a dollar 10. Inflation, that, I think, is... Back when our parents went to the movies, it was 50 cents. You see those old movies? Mm. It was 50 cents for a movie ticket. Now it's $26. Yes. How is yes. that possible? Yeah, that's right. It's just the cost of goods going up. That's in 40, you know, 40 years. That's inflation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's 100. Very good way of saying it. The same, the same way our parents earned, you know, the minimum wage was $30,000. And now it's like... 60 or whatever it is. Yeah. That's because inflation. Doesn't mean they were earning less money than us. No, no, exactly. So, you know, their purchasing power back then was greater than it was today. 50 yeah. cents actually meant something. Mm. Yeah. You know, today it means nothing. Yeah. You can go to so, the, the lolly store. And that's because the governments print money to yeah. give to people. And so when, when people ask a question, why can't we just print money? Yeah, you can. Oh, yeah. They, they printed money in Venezuela. Yeah. But you can't you can you can't give the money away because it's worth nothing. Yeah, right. In some African countries, like they've seen inflation of a thousand, two thousand percent. So your dollar today will hypothetically be worth ten cents next year. Yeah. Wow. Right. So what would you do? You just spend it today, knowing mm. that it'll be worth less tomorrow. Mm. You do that with anything. Oh, same with the Great Depression. They were printing money and using it as like wallpaper and stuff because it was so useless. Because it's useless, yeah. right? They wanted so food. They to, wanted commodities. To answer your question, yeah, you can print as much money as you bloody want, but it's just going to make your money worth less. Yeah. Right? And that's inflation. That's inflation. And the printing money is called, uh, what's that called? Monetary policy. Mm. And so if let's say, all right, we want to, People are going, so why can't we just solve world hunger by printing more money? Yeah. Because well, who's, who, whose currency are you going to print? Yeah. What, the uh, the Aussie dollar? No way. Well, like, it's we're already printing money. The world hunger is a very different issue, mm. by the way. And I think it's a great that we definitely should try and solve it. Mm. Well, um, as anything. Let's everybody say- needs to pitch in at the same time. Yeah. So everybody's currency is worth that little bit less. Yes. But you're not going to be able to get everyone to agree. So you need the United Nations to say, look, every country, if we all print money and we all rise at a similar inflation, mm. we can actually help solve these problems. But it's very unlikely to happen. Look, it may be, it may be more complicated think, yeah. th- than, than that. Or maybe we've just solved a world issue. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's. I mean, there's so many nuances. There's so many things going on. Politics. There's so many different things yeah. happening. Um, but I guess the point is, yeah, we can't. You can print money, and we are printing money. And yeah. as a result, you know, your money's going to. You know, you're, you're your earning money will be worth less. You know, which is the whole point of people are saying. 
because savings accounts are so low right now. Yeah. If your savings accounts at one point seven percent and yeah. inflation is rising at two percent, you're losing point three of a percent every year. Every year, that money sitting in that account is actually losing money. So and put it in a managed fund. Put it in the stocks. Do something with it. And so interest interest rates. So your bank would only be paying one point. What one point seven percent or whatever? I don't know. Any, the reason, good the reason rate right for now. that is because interest rates are so low, mm. and the reason why interest rates are so low is because our friends at the RBA um, they they want they want people to be spending money. They don't want you to have money in the bank account where mm. you'll earn interest and save it. They want you to be out there shopping, stimulating right? the economy, stimulating the economy. So they punish savers. Now. We saw um, interest rates right now are at all-time lows. They've never been lower. But it hypothetically is possible to go into the negative. Yes. People think, oh, interest rates can't go any lower. We're already at 0.25. And it's been in the negative. It's, it's in, not in Australia. Inflation has been in the negative. We saw deflation recently. Right. But, um, but you're paying the bank to put money in their account. Yeah, in, in America. Like oh. if you open an account with JP Morgan Chase right now, I believe that you have to pay, or Bank of New York it is, I believe that you have to pay the Bank of New York to hold your money. What, 1% or something? I don't know what it is. It's to cover their fees wow. and charges, but you are punished as a saver. Wow. You know, in Europe, there are negative interest rates. Insane. And it, it, I remember points I've heard in history, Australian history, we're on like 17%. So this is like, you know, your mum will tell you, yeah, yeah. back in my day, yeah, yeah, yeah. it cost 17% <laughs> for my mortgage. Yeah, yeah. The reason for that is because the economy was on fire, mm. right? Everything was just going gangbusters and it wasn't sustainable. So Paul Keating said, guys, we're going to have to call this off. So we're going to jack up interest rates through the roof, right? So people need to start paying interest mm. and so they don't have the money in their pocket to spend mm. and that's just the way that the RBA the government cools things off by pulling levers it's all lever pulling it's up so and down si- it's so simple isn't it it's like so why is interest rates low because we don't want people spending money no the interest no, rates are low because we want no, sorry, people yeah. spending we, we money we want people spending money because interest rates rates are low yes. why are interest rates high because we want people to put their money back in the account longer we- the short of it that's it that's it yeah. that's it I didn't know that and the reason you know this one key measure here that we really look at and that's that's inflation mm. right so the reserve bank of australia has the, a target of between two and three percent per year mm. and if the inflation comes out at one percent they go oh crap we need people spending more money so mm. let's lower interest rates right if inflation goes to five percent like it's, it's above our target let's let's make people feel that like they're poor again mm. and we're going to raise interest rates so they're just pulling levers right just supply and demand they're, they're well in a way yeah but they're just basically making people feel rich and poor. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's awesome. There's a whole. I, I want to do a whole episode on the economy and stuff because I feel like this is such important stuff. Um, but yeah, so that was... I want to talk about crypto real quick. So yeah. that was cool. Um, but I think that's kind of it. I think we've, we've hit the mark. I've, like, I've tried my best to give my take on how the stock market and how the economy works. Mm. I'm not an economist. No. You know, I failed high school. Well, we're just talking about real basic economic We're talking concepts. about some basic stuff, right? Yeah. Um, without any... We're explaining the lingo, the jargon. Mm. And, yeah. I think it's so important. But um, before we wrap up, it is worth noting to the listeners, I will, I've already said this in the intro, we've got this entire podcast basically written out as a little, you can follow along in a little PDF document which you've written yeah. for us, yep. which is awesome. So thank you for that. Um, that'll be available for free. Just download that in the description. Um, and you can go through, if you want to have this entire talk summarized into like, you know, a few pages which is awesome. Yeah. It's super, super simple. Then go download that right now. But now I want to jump into my final question, which is just what would your number one piece of advice be for younger generation? It could be anything. Number one piece of advice for the younger generation, get started in stocks mm. now. And don't, don't be put off by anybody in a suit or anybody talking jargon and lingo to you. Mm. Like it's, it's, all, it's all very simple, mm. you know, and back yourself. Yep. An easy way to get started, go to one of the three companies you mentioned, sign up based on where you are, get $50,000 of fake money, have a play with it, yeah. start dipping your toes in the water and off you go. Or even better, like that, oh, that 50 bucks or 100 bucks in your bank account, instead of blowing that at the pub tonight or whatever yeah. you're going to do with it, start an international share portfolio mm. and buy some of the world's sexiest companies. Because yeah, yeah. I guarantee when you wake up tomorrow and you've got those stocks in your account, like it's like nothing else you've felt before. Yeah. It's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Mitch, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. And for anyone who wants to find out more about you, connect with you on Instagram, LinkedIn, where's the best place to go to find out more? Yeah, look, so there's really no call to action. I'm not selling anything on today's podcast. I'm not paid anything. If you really want to find me, I am on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can, yeah, I'll be happy to help you. Yeah, awesome. And I'll put all the links below for, for that. But thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, mate. 
that's it for this episode of the Driven Young Podcast. Thank you so much for listening to the entire episode. That means the world to me. And if you got some value out of it, please shoot me a message on Instagram or reach out to me. Or I would love for you to leave a rating or review on this podcast. So make sure you are subscribed and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.